In the last PowerPoint, we discussed the concept of dynamic equilibrium. In this PowerPoint, we'll introduce the mathematical equation we use to characterize equilibrium. This is known as an equilibrium expression. Remember this, at equilibrium conditions, we reach steady state concentrations of our reactants in our products. This doesn't mean equal concentrations, it just means that the concentrations are steady. The equilibrium concentrations, when expressed as a ratio, will give us a constant value, known as the equilibrium constant. We can calculate this equilibrium constant, known as capital K, using the equilibrium expression, which is the ratio of our concentration of our products, in this case C and D, divided by the concentrations of our reactants, in this case A and B. Each of the concentrations of our products and our reactants are raised to the power of their coefficients from the balanced chemical equation. Let's look at an example of this. In this balanced chemical equation, one molecule of hydrogen reacts with one molecule of iodine to produce two molecules of hydrogen iodide. The equilibrium expression that we use to calculate K, our equilibrium constant, would be the equilibrium concentration of hydrogen iodide, our product, raised to the second power, which is the coefficient on hydrogen iodide in the balanced chemical equation. This is divided by the concentrations of our reactants, hydrogen and iodine, each raised to their coefficient, which is just one. Let's do one more equation. Here, two dinitrogen pentoxide molecules decompose into four nitrogen dioxide and one oxygen molecule. The equilibrium expression is the concentration of the products raised to their coefficients over the concentration of the reactants raised to their, their coefficients. In this case, that means the product concentration of nitrogen dioxide raised to the fourth power reflecting the four coefficient of nitrogen dioxide. This is multiplied by the second product, oxygen, raised to the one power. This is then divided by the concentration of our single reactant, dinitrogen pentoxide, raised to the second power, reflecting the two coefficient on the dinitrogen pentoxide. Once we have the equilibrium expression, we can calculate the equilibrium constant, K, using measured equilibrium concentrations of our reactants in our products. As long as the temperature is constant, we should be able to get a constant value for K using equilibrium concentrations. As an example of that, let's look at our reaction between hydrogen and iodine gas again. Here we have the equilibrium expression for this reaction that we figured out previously the concentration of hydrogen iodide squared over the concentration of hydrogen times the concentration of iodine. Now we also have four different starting mixes of reactants and products here, represented by the four different lines of the table here. In pink, we have the initial concentrations of the reactants and products in each reaction container. These represent the concentrations before we reach equilibrium. Highlighted in aqua are the equilibrium concentrations. These are the steady state concentrations we reach after we've let the reaction progress. Notice that we have different equilibrium concentrations for each trial, reflecting our different starting con conditions of reactants and products in each container. Since all these containers are at the same temperature, though, the ratio of concentrations of products to reactants should still give us the same constant value throughout. So let's test that. We plug our values for the first trial into our equilibrium expression, and we get a value of 50. 
we do the same for the equilibrium concentrations from the second trial, and we also get a value of 50. We repeat for the third trial and the fourth trial, and we get 50 again. So equilibrium concentrations will give us a constant value for the equilibrium expression as long as we conduct our experiments at constant temperature. The value of the equilibrium constant can give us important information about the balance between forward and reverse processes in our reaction. So say we have an equilibrium constant for a reaction that's really large. Since the constant ultimately reflects the ratio of product concentrations over reactants, a large value of K indicates a large numerator or product concentrations compared to our reactant concentrations. So in other words, when the value of our equilibrium constant is much greater than one, which means really large, our equilibrium favors our products. On the other hand, when the equilibrium constant value is really small, much less than one, then that means that our denominator, which represents our reactant concentrations, is much larger than our numerator. So in that case, we say that equilibrium favors the reactants. In the examples we've looked at so far, the reactants and products have only been gases. The equilibrium situation is slightly different when one or more of the reactants or products is a pure liquid or solid. For example, in this reaction, we would expect that our equilibrium expression would be this. The concentrations of our two products, carbon dioxide and carbon, in the numerator of our expression, divided by the concentration of our reactant carbon monoxide squared. The problem is that concentration isn't really a term that we can apply to pure solids and liquids. So we can't really say that the concentration of carbon, our solid carbon is going to change over the course of any particular reaction as we get to equilibrium. The closest that we have for characterizing amount per unit volume of a pure solid or a pure liquid is density. And, and density is a constant for uh, a pure solid or a liquid. It's not gonna change. If we have a large amount of our solid carbon versus a small amount, it's still gonna have the same density throughout. As a result, its amount won't change the position of equilibrium and we don't include it in our equilibrium expressions. So the correct equilibrium expression for this reaction is the concentration of our gaseous product, carbon dioxide, divided by the concentration of our gaseous reactant, carbon monoxide, squared. I do want to clarify that when I say that the amount of a pure solid or liquid reactant or product does not affect equilibrium, this only applies as long as there is some excess of the pure solid or liquid present. If all of the solid carbon were reacted away in this reaction, so if it was a limiting reactant for the reverse process, it would absolutely affect the rate of the reverse process. That rate would drop to zero, and we'd no longer be capable of reaching equilibrium if we weren't there already. So the amount of a pure liquid or solid reactant or product does not affect equilibrium as long as it is not the limiting reactant in the situation. If it's not present, if it is the limiting reactant, then equilibrium won't be reached and equilibrium expressions don't apply anymore. Now let's look at some more equilibrium expressions. In the first reaction, we have silicon tetrachloride gas reacting with hydrogen gas to produce si solid silicon and gaseous hydrogen chloride. The equilibrium expression for this reaction is the concentration of hydrogen chloride raised to the fourth power divided by the concentration of silicon tetrachloride and the concentration of hydrogen gas raised to the second power. 
Silicon is not included in this equilibrium expression because it is a pure solid, as represented by the S symbol following the symbol for silicon. In our second reaction, we have mercury 2 chloride as a solid dissolving to produce mercury 2 plus ion in solution and chloride ion in solution. The solution is represented by the AQ symbol following this, the formulas for the mercury and the chloride ions. The equilibrium expression for this reaction is the concentration of our mercury 2 plus ion times the concentration of our chloride ion raised to the second power. Because our reactant is solid and it is our only reactant, we cannot include it in our equilibrium expression as a denominator. In this case, we only have the concentration of our products as part of our equilibrium expression. Finally, in our last reaction, we have a solution of ammonia, NH3, reacting with water to produce ammonium ion, NH4, plus, and hydroxide ion, OH negative. Both the ammonium and the hydroxide are dissolved in the water in solution as represented by the AQ following their formulas. The equilibrium expression, then, is the concentration of our products, ammonium ion times hydroxide ion, divided by the concentration of ammonia. Pure water is not included in this equilibrium expression. In heterogeneous or mixed phase reactions, we leave the pure solid and liquid reactants and products out of the equilibrium expressions. Gases, on the other hand, we include, and we can express their concentrations at equilibrium in two ways. In units of molarity, or moles per liter, denoted with brackets, or as partial pressures measured in units of atmospheres. The value of the equilibrium constant calculated will depend on whether it was calculated using moles per liter or partial pressures. As a result, when we talk about equilibrium constants for gaseous reactions, we talk about K sub C constants and K sub P constants. K sub C is calculated using moles per liter for all concentrations of the gaseous reactants and products. K sub P is calculated using partial pressure measurements in units of atmosphere. Because the values of KP and KC may not be the same for one reaction, it's important to note which one you are dealing with. It is possible to convert between K sub C and K sub P for gaseous reactions using the ideal gas law. Your textbook shows this derivation, and you can look it up if you'd like to see it. I'm just going to show you the final formula for converting between the two equilibrium constants. K sub P equals the value of K sub C times the ideal gas constant times the temperature in parentheses raised to the power of delta N. Delta N stands for the difference between the number of moles of gaseous products in the balanced chemical equation and the moles of gaseous reactants. The number of moles in the balanced chemical equations is represented by the coefficients. The value of the ideal gas constant we use is 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres per mole per Kelvin, and the temperature is expressed in units of Kelvin. Let's look at an example calculation using this formula. We're asked to calculate the value of K sub C for the reaction of nitrogen monoxide and oxygen to produce gaseous nitrogen dioxide. This reaction is completely in the gas phase, and the literature value of the equilibrium constant we find is calculated using partial pressures instead of moles per liter. So we're given K sub P, and we need to calculate K sub C. To do this, we'll need to use the conversion formula, and we can rearrange this formula to solve for K sub C by dividing by RT raised to the delta N power. 
We know the equilibrium constant in units of pressure, K sub P. We know R and we know T. We just need to figure out that delta N term. But we know it represents the difference in moles of gaseous products and gaseous reactants as represented by the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. So for our reaction, we have two moles of our gaseous product, nitrogen dioxide. On the reactant side, we have two moles of nitrogen monoxide and one mole of oxygen gas. This gives us three moles total of gaseous reactants. Products minus reactants gives us a delta N value of negative one. Now we can plug this into our equation for K sub C. We also use the K sub P value given of 2.2 times 10 to the 12th and the R value of 0 0.08206 atmospheres times liters divided by moles Kelvin and a temperature of 298 Kelvin. This gives us a K sub C value of 5.4 times 10 to the 13th. Notice that we ignore the units on R and temperature and have K as a unitless number. This is one of the few times in chemistry that we tell you to ignore units. Let's talk a little bit more about this. Technically, equilibrium constants do not have units. The reason for this is a little beyond where we are in the course right now. Briefly, the position of equilibrium in a reaction is related to energy relationships, and energy relationships for a reaction are always expressed relative to a standard state condition. For solutions, this standard state is one mole per liter. For gases, it's one atmosphere of partial pressure. To account for this standard state in our equilibrium expressions, we actually use a ratio of our measured concentration and pressure over the standard state concentration and pressure in our equilibrium calculations. So what does this look like? Say we measure partial pressure for a gas of 1.5 atmospheres. Technically, what we plug into the equilibrium expression is the ratio of 1.5 atmospheres divided by the standard one atmosphere. Our units of atmospheres actually cancel out in this process and the value of pressure that we plug into our expression is unitless. This means that our equilibrium constant will also be unitless. In summary, for the general reaction, A plus B produces C plus D, we can write the equilibrium expression as the concentration of our products, C and D in this case, raised to the power of their coefficients from the balanced chemical equation over the concentration of the reactants, A and B in this example, raised to the power of their coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. The value of the equilibrium constant, K, can tell us about the balance between the concentration of products and reactants at equilibrium. When K is large, we say that the equilibrium position favors the products. When K is small, we say that the equilibrium position favors the reactants. When pure solids and liquids are present in a reaction, we do not include these in our equilibrium expressions. And for gaseous reactions, our equilibrium constant K can actually be calculated with measurements of partial pressure or molarity. If measurements of partial pressure are used, the K value is designated as K sub P. If molarity is used, the K value is designated as K sub C.